Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to um, talk to you today kind of about one of my biggest passions, which is um, creating and leveraging and implementing technology to really help move forward the patient experience and not just the patient experience, but patient engagement, which is really what we need to sort of transform health. So um, just as the agenda and kind of disclosures here, I'm going to talk about why patient engagement, why do we need to focus our efforts here. Um, talking a little bit more to expand the concept of technology is not enough. It's not just about throwing technology out there and hoping that it sticks, but it's really about kind of aligning your vision and your culture and your organization with that technology to make it successful. Um, and then including the patient voice really in IT strategy and with your IT governance process. And using engagement tools within your organization as well as um, managing conditions remotely when your patients walk out your door. So one disclosure is I am um, co-founder of Recover.me, which is an independent startup, not really affiliated with UCLA and not affiliated with Southern California Hymns. I do have one kind of slide picture in there, and I'm not trying to sell you my product, but I'm trying to use it as an example of kind of why you need to make technology patient focused in order for it to be successful. So I hope that you take that same strategy and move it forward into your technology projects. So engagement. Uh, we think about engagement, and engagement is really getting and keeping someone's attention and their interests, right? It's very easy to throw cool technology out there, and it's really easy to get people to use it for a little while. But what's harder is to get that to stick and to get people to keep using it for the long run in a way that helps um, change their health behavior and change their outcome. So engagement is a pledge to oneself to begin and to carry on with an enterprise or an activity. And the act of engagement really includes an emotional involvement or a pledge or a commitment to keep doing something. So um, how many of you guys have ever sort of tracked your fitness? How many have tracked with a Fitbit or have tracked with Misfit, Fitbit, Fuel Band? Um, keep, keep, put your hands up. And then keep your hands up if you're still tracking today. OK, so that's, that's a good example of, um, you know, you can, you can get people to try it, but you can't get people to keep going with it. So I am, I am a big fan of health technology. I love all the shiny objects, but we need to figure out how to use those shiny objects and then make them transform health. So uh, other question I want to throw out to the audience just to kind of get a sense of who we have here. How many of you are um, in the IT shop? OK, great. And it's OK to raise your hand more than once here. So how many of you are kind of providers or front, front line giving care to patients? OK. And how many of you are politicians uh, or healthcare managers that need to lead strategy and keep your patients happy and your, uh, your teams happy? OK. And then how many of you are patients? OK. So we, we all wear these multiple hats, right? And we really need those four groups to come together to be successful in creating the change we need to see to move health forward. So I'm going to try to speak to, um, to, to all of those roles here today and, and, and really encourage you to kind of work and bridge across those teams to make things successful. And that's kind of one of the powerful things that clinical informatics can do is really being the bridge between the clinicians and the technologists and the patients. So. Uh, has anyone ever heard of Simon Sinek? Simon Sinek is a great thought leader. If you haven't seen his TED Talk, go see it. Um, I'm going to borrow from him here. And his, uh, his main point is that you have to start with why. When you're trying to transform or communicate an idea, you don't just start with how you do that or what you do. You have to talk about the why. So in the healthcare industry, we are about to make this major shift from getting paid for when patients show up in our doorstep to getting paid for keeping them out of our organizations and keeping them well. And that is not an easy change, and it's a change that is going to be, um, success is going to be contingent largely on getting patients to change their behavior. So that is the challenge. It's not just um, can we introduce something. We're really good at telling patients go take this medicine or stop smoking or um, you know, go exercise three times a day. But getting them to actually walk out your door and do that thing is the hard part, right? So we really need creative and innovative solutions that help the patients connect with their why of why they want to get better and, and move forward to actually do those behaviors that you want to see from them. So what, what does this? So we really need to design compelling and user-friendly technology solutions to help our patients remember, this is why I need to get better. Um, and we really need to meet that demand that the consumer industry has created for 
instant availability of information, right? Um, we've heard a lot from other speakers that are kind of our industry is a little bit behind here. I can go online and do my banking transactions immediately. But it's a little tougher for me to go online and see the note that my doctor just wrote about me. So I, we really, as an industry, need to kind of catch up in that space and get on board with um, really usable information that's immediately accessible. So how do we do this? We have to make our technology sticky. We have to make it compelling and engaging. We have to make our patients want to do that thing that they know they should do. Uh, we have to shift our management culture. It's not just about giving the technology. It's about building the, the management infrastructure around our organization so that we can make that, um, that technology successful. And then finally, we have to listen to our patients. Just as we have to listen to our clinicians on what are the biggest problems that we need to solve with technology, we have to listen to our patients and say, what do you need to be successful at managing your health? And we have to really bring that patient voice to our operations and to our IT strategy to be successful. So um, this is just a little bit about who are our IT customers. So our, our providers are our customers, our nurses, our front desk staff, our financial services people. All of the people that work in our organizations are our kind of IT customers. But this, this graph sort of makes the point that, that our patients are our customers too. And if you look at the people that actually touch our electronic health record at UCLA, this paints a really good picture of, of it's really that our patients are our customers. So if you look at the 20,000 staff and providers or so that are logging into our medical record, we're up at 150,000 patients now that are logging into their patient portal in our medical record. And to me, this, this paints kind of a compelling picture of why we should really focus our efforts on our tools to make our patients successful, not spend all of our resources just on doing what our staff needs. Okay, so I am really proud to have worked at UCLA for 15 years, and I think that um, they bring a really good lesson in how to focus on the patient. And so the mission at UCLA is healing humankind one patient at a time by improving health, alleviating suffer and suffering, and delivering acts of kindness. So it's pretty cool if you've ever heard David Feinberg speak. There's not another kind of mission that has delivering acts of kindness in there. And I think that putting that mission first when you are teaching your employees, when you're implementing a process, or when you're implementing a technology, is really important to kind of take it back to the why. We're here because we take care of patients and we want to make patients healthy. Uh, they've implemented a management practice called CI Care, and really it's an acronym about connecting with your patients, introducing them to what's going on, communicating what's happening, asking if they have questions, and then responding and then exiting in a way that lets them know what's happening next. So all of our staff at UCLA, all of our physicians, all learn this when they are onboarded, and it's ingrained into the culture there. So um, that's part of why when we introduce a patient-facing technology, it's not just that technology, but it's about the people and how they're using that technology that makes it successful. So if you don't have the culture for putting the patient first and focusing on that next patient that walks in the door, it's very slim uh, chance that you're going to get that patient-facing technology to really work. Because the thing that the patient sees is really that the person that they're interacting with. So it's, it's quite important, I think, to kind of merge those together. Uh, PCAT rounding. So uh, PCAT stands for Peer CI Care Assessment Tools. And this is really just standard work for the leadership team at UCLA, anyone that's a director, a manager of a clinical care area, and other areas, actually goes out on structured rounds and talks to staff and talks to patients to hear about the patient experience. So it's very important that you get that patient voice and that you hear from the patient, how is your experience? What can we do to do better? And nine times out of 10, you go out on these rounds, and the patient's like, I love it here. This is great. I've had the best, you know, the best experience ever. And you really have to kind of dig and say, well, what is it that we could do better? And then the team kind of regroups and brings that back and talks about, well, what was that one thing that we could do better? And then they try to implement that into, um, into their daily practice. So I just start with these things because we can design really amazing technology, but if you don't have the people on the background um, to implement that technology, it's, it's not gonna go quite as far. So, so start here. Uh, recently, in the past uh, three months, we have created a new IT, um, patient-facing IT um, technology council. So we've got a number of different patient experience councils. We've got the family, 
patient experience council or the, the, the parents of kids that have services at UCLA come and they talk about what we could do better. And we've got different service lines. And this is a new one for patients to give us feedback about how we are using our technology. What are we giving you in our patient portal that works? What would you like to see in our patient portal? What could we do better? Um, so we had the first meeting of this council um, about four weeks ago. And it was 10 patients who we kind of put the invitation out there and we asked for um, you know, doctors and, and nurses to give us people that were interested and have used a lot of our different services, inpatient and outpatient, to, um, to come to the table and to give us feedback. And we got a really overwhelming response and it was a great two hour session and the patients um, showed up and at first we're a little bit shy about talking but by the end of the session, it was like drinking from a fire hose. You could not get them to stop giving us feedback. You know, they, they really wanted to contribute. Um, and some of the information we heard, we, we, you know, we kind of expected to hear certain things, like we want more mobile, we want more information, we want it faster. But we heard a lot of information that we didn't know were problems. And we heard a lot of information that, had we not asked, we never would have focused in that direction. So. Um, that was really powerful and gave us sort of a more powerful input to bring to our governance structure and say, your, um, you know, our patient portal committee might not prioritize this feature over the other, but when you ask our patients, this is what they really want. So I would kind of urge you to, to take the time, as you do, to take the time to listen to your staff and your clinicians about what they need. Um, think about um, getting to your patients and kind of asking them for feedback. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the IT tools that you can use kind of just within your organization and give you some examples of what we're doing um, at UCLA and some other examples um, that happen within your walls. And these are just kind of examples. We don't have all the answers. Um, we're in early phases of many pilots that I'm going to talk about. So some of these are kind of just starting off as little inc incubators and little um, innovation pilots. but. Uh, they are something to watch, and we live by the concept you've, you need to kind of rapidly innovate and then fail fast. So take the time to get it started, um, but start it quickly and um, see if it's successful before you spend a ton of resources to integrate it. So one of the tools was, I mentioned those active leadership rounds. Um, this is a tool for the management staff that help facilitate that in-person discussion that they have with patients when they go talk to patients. So we talk to patients, we go to certain areas, we make sure that someone is rounding in each of our different inpatient units and some of our outpatient clinics that are close by, and we talk to staff and patients. And this is kind of, kind of a homegrown web tool that lets that manager input different feedback that we've gotten from patients. So it lets them track kind of which area they've been to, it lets them track certain discrete questions and then also track just comments and feedback that the patient would like to give. So our patient experience office takes this information, reads every one of them, um, follows up to the patient if follow-up is needed. And um, it's also a good way to do staff recognition. So if the patient is really um, raving about a certain staff member, the staff member gets recognized at kind of the next management. Uh, forum and it's a great way of just giving a tool to the manager to help support this process. So again, this technology alone is not it's not what's what's helping things. It's really the management process that um, that people are using to to get that patient voice. So another way that we're doing this is we have implemented a small pilot of tablets on one inpatient unit. And we're getting um, real-time patient experience feedback from the tablets. And we are kind of collecting them in real time, and we are uh, routing them to a local response pool. So we have a pool of charge nurses that gets an email when there is a new message received. And these are flagged for, I need to follow up, or this is just FYI. Um, so we ask the patient questions like, do you have the information you need to be an active member of your care? And they can click on agree or disagree. And if they disagree, we say, well, what, what's, what could we improve? What information do you need to help improve your hospitalization? So they can type in, you know, I'm not sure, you know, who, who my doctor is, or I'm not sure, you know, who, who is this specialist that came to me, or I'm not sure who's going to write my discharge order. And then that gets routed to the charge nurse so that she can go have a conversation with that patient to help really get them on the same page and help give them the, um, the education that they need. 
The other thing that we are doing with this, um, this, this pilot is we're asking, what would you like to see on this tablet? You know, is it entertainment content that you want? Is it, do you want to browse? What is the most useful information that we can give you on this, um, this iPad that you're holding? So we are, you know, we're just getting started with this. We found it's very hard to have the patients actually fill them out unless someone's saying, fill out the, you know, fill out the questionnaire. It's very hard to get patients to actually fill it out. But when you do, it's really valuable feedback. And when they need an action item or it gets, it gets flagged for response, they're super appreciative to have that charge nurse come speak with them. Uh, the patient story. So somebody else um, before me had mentioned, you know, how do we really capture the patient story in our electronic health record? Um, the, the, the fear with some of these electronic health record implementations is your clinicians and your nurses have to click through so many different screens that are they going to lose that core picture of why is this patient here? What's important to them today? What do I need to do? Um, so we, before we implemented, we designed the patient story to really capture the heart of what's happening with that patient. And we have on there the clinical goals for the shift, so that every shift, the nurse has a conversation during bedside rounds with that patient to talk about what are their goals for today. Um, at the start of the journey for the patient, they they have the admission navigator, which helps them enter information like, how do I make a connection with this patient? What's important to this patient? What do they prefer to be called? Um, getting to know me adds certain information about that patient that's not really clinical. Maybe they have a dog at home. Maybe their daughter likes to visit on Tuesdays. But making it really personal for that patient. And then other things like spiritual care. And they made the really smart decision to make that the first screen that every clinician that touches the patient sees when they open that patient's record is the patient's story. So I think um, that's a, that was a really good implementation decision that really helped um, kind of focus the clinical staff on the care for the patient. Um, so I mentioned this inpatient tablet pilot. Uh, we had, you know, all of the units wanted to be the pilot unit. So we, we've, we're starting it off on two of our units, our oncology unit and our cardiology unit. And um, really the core goals of giving patient tablets are first and foremost to kind of improve the patient experience, to really empower them to take an active role in managing their outcomes, and to help improve communication, not just between the patient and their um, their care team, but their actual support team, so like being able to Skype with their family who might not be able to visit them in the hospital. Um, facilitating communication um, across the continuum, so if I give a patient a piece of education uh, in the hospital, and they, they may or may not have been a little groggy when I gave them that education, we really want them to be able to take that and then use it again when they get home, so kind of bridging that education across the continuum of care. And then finally, planning a sustainable support model for this technology that protects the patient data and that's scalable. So that's kind of what we were trying to find in this pilot. Um, what we found was that patients really love the entertainment value. If they could only have one thing on there, it would be that they could get to that Netflix account. Um, <laughs> Uh, they, they really like, we put a couple games on there too. They like their Angry Birds and their solitaire games. Um, they liked being able to search the internet. Um, so hours on a hospital bed are, are not so fun as, as many of us know, but being able to search the internet and kind of find information was helpful. They loved making the social connection. A lot of our patients did take, take us up on that offer to Skype with their families um, and to connect with their social media accounts. And then they finally, they really like using our patient portal to check their labs. So on our oncology units, our, um, our patients can log into their patient portal and check their labs and really see them um, in almost real time, maybe before their physician's round. So that was very um, successful, and uh, it prevented the nurses from having to go print labs and post them in all of their rooms. Some of the challenges, as you might um, expect, are actually clearing the data and resetting the devices between each patient. So on our oncology unit, our patients stay for several, several weeks, weeks sometimes when they're getting their um, treatment. So it's a little bit less of a turnover. But our cardiology unit is you know, four, four day admissions maybe. So every single time the patient turns that iPad back in, we have to have an IT person touch that device to clear the data and to reset it. So even with our best use of our mobile device management software, um, this isn't really a scalable process. So we're still kind of working on that and we are um, really talking to our MDM vendors and the, the device vendors on trying to get us a more scalable solution. 
Another challenge is that patients, of course, they want their own apps on there. They don't like the 30 apps that we picked. They want to they wanna tell us, can we put this on? Can we put this on? And it's, it's, it's difficult to accommodate that, so we, well, we, we're not quite there right now. I mentioned the survey. Um, I, I really hope we can get more patients to fill out the survey, because when they do and they need a response and they get it, it's fantastic. They, they love having the, um, the staff come in. But when I kind of round and talk to these patients, they're like, oh yeah, that survey. So unless, unless somebody's really there kind of encouraging them to take it, it's not something that they, they kind of go find on their own. And then finally, we're kind of checking on, you know, how many patients just bring their own tablet rather than using ours? So we're expecting, we are seeing a lot more bring your own device than, than we um, anticipated. And we're continuing to kind of track that, me that, um, that metric as we go about kind of scaling this. And I just put that picture there. If plan A didn't work, the alphabet has 24 more letters. <laughs> Stay cool. So, you know, our, our way that we're resetting these devices is not quite working right now, and it's not, like, super scalable. So we're really trying to kind of push that forward and um, find a better reset process that will allow us to scale this to, to one per hospital bed. Um, so we're, we're still, that's why having kind of a small pilot unit and Again, failing fast on something to find a better way is really important before you, before you go big bang. Um, kind of our next step, so uh, we, are, uh, we are an epic shop, and um, our patient portal we have right now is really largely geared towards the outpatient population, but they have a new tool that they are making available for an inpatient-focused um, uh, patient portal. And so what that does is it really customizes it and allows the patient to have a more focused view of what's happening to them today. So if you think about, I don't know if you've, how many of you have ever been hospitalized? Okay, so in an academic medical center, it's not uncommon to get a knock on the door and have 10 white coats walk in the room and start talking to you. And it's very, um, you know, it's hard when you don't know who's taking care of you and there's 10 people in your room talking to you and you're, you know, you're the patient, you're sick in this bed, it's, you know, it's very, it's almost kind of like a fearful experience. You don't know what's gonna happen next. And um, one of the things to help make it better is to give the patient information about who's taking care of me. So this solution will allow us to put the, the provider's pictures right from our treatment team of who's taking care of them today. Who is your attending? Who is the resident taking care of you today? Who is your nurse today? Who is your physical therapist? And then read a little bit about that person and kind of what that role does in the organization and have that available in real time. So this kind of goes beyond the whiteboard of my nurse's name is on the whiteboard and lets you look and say, oh, here's what a care partner does in the organization. Here's what my attending does versus what my resident does. It also gives information about kind of what's happening today. You are here for, your problem list, um, the problems that we're taking care of you in this hospital stay. Here's your medications that are coming next. It will also let our um, patients message the care team and let the care team respond um, by messaging. Okay, so that, um, that was one tool. We've got a number of kind of rogue IT efforts happening. Um, our IT organization does not have a mobile app development service line yet. Um, but in the absence of that, some of our physicians have gone off and said, hey, I really need an app for that. They are going and um, talking to our School of Engineering, and they're going and talking to our School of Computer Science. They're like, someone else is doing this in the organization. We're going to partner with you and have you make our app. So one of those was a, a brilliant physician named Frank Day, who is the co-chair of our Patient Education and Engagement Committee. And his focus is really on empowering the patient to make clinically informed decisions based on education around what preferences they will have for their care. And it fully recognizes that some patients are, are different on the scale of what they would like for their care based on what's available. So th they made a prototype of this shared decision-making app. Um, it's around prostate uh, cancer screening. So it gives information to the patient about what are the decisions and the different risks for various treatment options. It lets the patient really visualize kind of what the risk comparison model is if you have PSA screening or not a PSA screening. And it lets them kind of enter patient value preferences based on their care. And knowing full well that that value preference might change if that patient has a change in um, a life event. 
But this is kind of an early start to kind of take that personal opinion from that patient and let them enter their care preferences. So this is not live yet. This is something that we're working on getting live. And of course, if it works, then the question is, well, how do you integrate it? So we've got um, a number of teams looking at the integration challenge of, of bringing mobile and merging that with our key clinical tools. So next is remote condition management. So again, we can tell our patients, take this medication, um, you know, come back in a couple weeks. We can tell them what to do, but we can't, you know, once they walk out the door, we don't have very much control over what they actually do. So um, we've got a couple tools emerging to help us remotely monitor and track patients and get really actionable information back into the hands of the clinicians or the coordinator that's caring for that patient remotely to help guide them. So one of these is um, an app called Prime, which is a wireless health initiative um, that has created a web and a mobile application to um, pilot um, kind of remote disease management for high-risk populations. So the first, um, the first application that they've developed is for colorectal surgery patients. So they give the patient a tablet when they're in the hospital following surgery. And for the first few weeks after surgery, when they are most likely to run into complications, they take the tablet home. They answer daily um, questions about how they're doing. They snap an image of their wound. And they track certain metrics like heart rate or ambulation. And that information is fed back to the provider in sort of a dashboard summary view. So they can see the trending of that information um, kind of right, right in the system in front of them. And we've got a clinical coordinator that, look, that reviews these and reaches out to patients if there is a trend that looks like the patient might be going south. And they've, you know, they've just started this, but they've really found... Um, a significant decrease in readmission rates by this type of monitoring. So uh, the question then becomes, how do you take this and scale it to different um, populations, and how do you integrate it within the workflows? Another example of some targeted disease management is a UC Health initiative around value-based care. And they have made a prototypical um, application for, for IBD, so inflammatory bowel disease management. One of our um, pioneering innovators is Dr. Dan Holmes, who um, is a gastric disease specialist. And he, again, has partnered with someone and made an app for what he would like to do. And it is is been used by 1,000 patients so far across multiple locations. We have 12 different physicians piloting this and three nurse coordinators. And again, it's a web and a mobile application that really um, helps to visualize, helps the patient to visualize where they're at, visualize their engagement level, and it matches with the, um, the payer information so that they can get a value quotient of how well am I doing compared to how much is being spent on my health care. So similar to the other one, it sends them survey questions, and the physician actually enters a care pathway for them based on their clinical presentation. And then the app along the care pathway times delivery of education or of tasks that are needed for follow-up. So if I'm in care pathway one that's more acute, I need to go to the doctor for my follow-up every, so, um, every so many weeks versus every so many months, and I need to go to get my labs this often. So um, some of the successes for this particular application are really around before they implemented, the business did a really strong job of value chain mapping what services are they providing and what and discreetly defining kind of what are those patient engagement tasks that the patient needs to do to be successful. So they went into their technology solution with a plan to manage this information, a, a well-defined clear path of, of um, patient tasks um, based on their clinical presentation, and a strong kind of engagement layer for the patient to look at to visualize how they're doing and what do I need to do next. So that's one to watch. They're, they're looking to scale that across um, 30 different disease states. They're looking to integrate it with the electronic health record and, and make it California-wide. Okay, and this is the one that I mentioned before. This is not a UCLA project, but it's my own personal pet project. So I'm a physical therapist by background. I'm married to a user experience designer, and we had the idea for kind of a physical therapy app. 
So who's ever gone for physical therapy services? So you probably got an exercise paper, right? And you go home and, okay, the, you go do your exercises. And it's really easy to, you know, oh, it's, it's you know, the exercises kind of hurt or um, I don't really feel like doing the exercises now. It's really easy to walk by that piece of paper and actually not do them and not get better because of that. So for our solution, it times um, reminders, and it ties um, an information that the patient puts, puts the picture in of, wh of why they want to get better. So for this particular patient, he had a knee um, injury, and he wanted to get better because his, you know, his, he, his son wanted to learn how to roller skate. So it's harder to ignore that picture of your son that pops up on the reminder than it is to just walk by that piece of paper. And so making the personal connection with what, why that patient should do what they need to do is what I believe will be transformative in making these technology tools work to actually change patient behavior. So um, kind of key tenants are patient-specific content. Um, really have that conversation with the patient about their goals. It's not just what can you do, it's why do you want to get better, and then reconnecting with that why every time you send them the reminder or you, you call for the action. User-friendly design is super important. If they open the app and it doesn't work, they're not gonna use it. If, if, they, don't, if they haven't caught on to how to use it the first time they open it, it's, it's done. Um, so visualizing the status is also really important. In that IBD app, there is a visual monitor of patient um, participation. And with this one, there's a visual monitor of, um, I did my exercise program. So giving that um, real visual feedback of, of how we're doing compared to how I'm supposed to do um, is, a, is a helpful motivator. And then finally, how do, you, how do you set up a rewards and gamification system to make it more sticky? How do, uh, you know, how do I incent um, behavior change in a way that makes the patient actually want to go do those exercises? So that's gonna be the challenge. Um, and finally, the, the patient portal. So how many of you guys have turned on patient portals using kind of traditional uh, vendor, whatever vendor that you have? Okay, Who, who's, and does anyone have a custom patient portal out there? There's a couple organizations um, that are, have been really successful using cu custom patient portals, but of course it takes their team of 10 developers to, to build that and to maintain it. And so, of course, in the IT shop, we're, we're constantly battling, do we go build something ourselves or do we you know, wait for our vendor to catch up with what we need? And that's, that's, a, that's kind of like the lifelong conversation that we're going to keep having. So we need to keep um, you know, walking the balance line of how do we innovate locally and then how do we partner with our vendor to kind of push their level of innovating to what, to what our organization needs. So um, I am a strong advocate for patient portals. I think you should turn on every feature that your patient portal allows and that you can manage um, on, on, the, on the operational side. Um, our patient portal, again, has 150,000 users, which is about 36% of our population. And we think we're doing pretty well with that, but that number needs to really go up to, to reach the impact that we can reach with it. Um, where we're going next with our patient portal, um, how many of you have heard of Open Notes? So Open Notes is a kind of national initiative for really showing patients what the, what the doctor is writing in their medical record. And there's, it's controversial, right? There's a lot of fear on the provider side of what are they gonna think when they read that note? They're not gonna understand it. Why, why do you wanna show them my note that I wrote? Um, and then on the patient side, wouldn't you wanna see that note? Like I'm, I'm a healthcare professional. If I go get a service, I sure wanna read what they wrote about me so that I can you know, go understand it. So we, we talked to our patient, uh, we talked to our patient te technology council and we asked them about it. We said, what if you read something in a note that uh, you didn't quite understand? They're like, Google, duh. Like, we, if we don't understand it, we're going to go look it up. Like, that's not at all what we're, you know, uh, we're worried about. We want the information. We want it now. So we're, we're excited that we've got a couple pilot areas that are, that are providing doctor's notes to patients. And um, really, the early studies internationally have shown that uh, patients feel more in control of their care when they, when they have visibility and transparency into what's happening. And they actually had better medication compliance um, with these early studies. I cited a study on there. Uh, that I'm getting that from, but they actually found that patients adhered to their medications uh, uh, that were recommended more um, readily when they when they had an open note structure. So we're we're looking at that. 
Um, we're expanding personal health record options. We are looking at implementing patient-entered questionnaires and uh, patient-entered data. And we are looking at a model for implementing e-visits, which is more of a kind of store and forward type technology that are disease specific uh, questions. Uh, if you have, you know, you have ear pain or you think you have an ear infection, hang, um, answer these questions, route it to a response pool, um, see if that patient needs to come in for a visit or if whether that doctor can e prescribe something based on that. Uh, we are looking at implementing video visits uh, within our patient portal. And we are looking at um, the kind of ever elusive internet of things and how do we integrate our devices like Fitbit or how do we use kind of Apple's health kit to integrate with our record. So um, has anyone already integrated Fitbit or health kit? A couple. So it's, it's not easy, right? It's not as easy as you would think. You have to make decisions around, well, now that I have this information, I'm kind of liable to act on it. So um, there's, there's a lot of sort of angst on the provider side of when, when I have this, this, this big data deluge of information, what do I do with it? So we're, we, we are personally looking at um, kind of smaller clinical pilots that they already are tracking this in some way. So we've got our kind of PEDS cardiology unit is already um, tracking high-risk kiddos and asking for them to send the nurse or the doctor daily weights um, and, and daily vitals. So we're going to, our approach is that we're going to kind of start with the folks that already have an operational management structure behind this. They've already defined their thresholds. Um, but go in full well knowing that we have to level set with our patients. That if you see some, you know, if, if you go outside of our threshold that we've given you, don't just put it in there. You still have to pick up the phone and call um, to make it safe. So we're looking at some future pilots of that. And then finally, I'm excited about kind of our fast pass technology. We have not implemented this yet, but we are looking at kind of clinic wait list. So if our clinic is booked and we have a wait list of patients, we're looking at messaging um, the patient for um, when an appointment becomes available in real time and letting them say, yep, I'm coming in. Um, so that's kind of on the, on the future horizon, but we're making plans for that now. So I think that tools like this that, that again, are supported by um, an operational management practice, but are extra tidbits to help the patient really manage themselves and interact with your system will really be the future of um, kind of how to push things forward uh, on the patient engagement front. So kind of key takeaways, again, it's not, you know, it's not the technology alone that's going to create any, any issues. Um, it, it's not the technology that's going to change. It's the people that implement the technology and the practice behind it that will make it transformative. Um, so again, creating that active management approach for patient engagement is, is super important. And, and really including the patient voice in your strategy so you're not just giving them tools you think they need but that they're asking for. Um, and then making those tech solutions sticky. Make, make them want to keep using it. Um, design it well enough that it's engaging and motivating. And then last but not least, make it about the next patient that walks in your door. You might have a different goal and a different um, reason for showing up than you do. And finding the why for that particular patient is going to make all the difference in your ability to sort of engage them and help them get more healthy.